Yes, I see that it's live streaming. Yes, I see. Streaming. Thanks to everybody who's already here. We're just gonna wait a couple of minutes for everybody else to trickle in. So just a couple of minutes now. All right, then we'll get started. I would just like to say hello and welcome to this special book discussion event that brings together author, translator, publisher, academic around a discussion of the newly released English translation of The Monotonous Chaos of Existence by Hisham Bustani, who is here to join us today, translated by Maya Thovit, who's also here to join us today and out from Mason Jar Press, whose editor, Michael Tagger is also here as well. Um, just to briefly introduce everybody who's here with us before we uh, begin the discussion. And, and also I just want to say, and I'll repeat this several times, which is that you are free to put in questions at any point in the discussion, and then we will get to audience questions um, uh, at the end or whenever they make sense, really. Um, so please go ahead and add them in the chat function in YouTube, or else you can you can tag us on, on Twitter and I'll check that as well. Um, so to introduce everyone, Hashem is an award-winning Jordanian author of five collections of short fiction and poetry. His most recent book, which is this one was published in January from Mason Jar Press. Maya is an Arabic English literary translator based in Washington DC, where she is also the associate editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies. She's translator of this book, as well as Sinan Antoine's A Baghdad Eucharist, Elias Khoury's White Masks, and other acclaimed novels, short stories, and more. Michael B. Tager is managing editor of Mason Jar Press, also a writer and editor. His work has appeared many places, 
And you can find out more through his website, which is michaelbutager.com. Pete Moore is currently the Visit Kuwait Chair at the Paris School of International Studies. He currently also serves on the editorial committee of MARIP, the Middle East Report, and is a member of the Northeast Ohio Consortium of Middle East Studies. So, so thanks to everybody for coming together around this event today. Greatly appreciated. So I wanted to just pivot and start with Hishem. Um, uh, and and um, both as a writer and as an editor, uh, to me, the short story is one of the most sort of interesting and flexible genres that gets the least critical attention um, and, you know, prizes and, and sort of the least critical glory, but also, you know, sort of critical focus. I wanted to know what draws you to the short story in particular when so much, you know, currently revolves around the novel um, and what you find are some of the sort of most interesting things going on around short story creation and, and the whole genre of short stories in, both in Arabic and, and in English and other languages. Yes, thank you. And glad to be here with all, with all the others. Um, yeah, and you've, you've actually pinned the point about the short story being very flexible. For me, it's a very flexible artistic tool. Uh, and I would say it's raw in the sense that it accepts a lot of uh, experimentation. Uh, and it can be molded in, in, in many uh, kinds of ways, can be integrated with, with other arts like photography, paintings sometimes, uh, which I use in my, in my writing a lot, uh, poetry. Uh, and, and it has a lot of formats that you can also play with. So you can write a short, short story, a short story, a long short story, a flash fiction. And each uh, subject somehow calls to a different format. So form, the literary form itself is, is, is particular to each written story. So in one collection, you can uh, look at uh, many, many different ways of of how to write rather than what to write, which is actually, for me, is the essence of literature. The how question uh, is the basic question about uh, art. And this is why I find myself, despite all, as you said, negligence that this wonderful art is, is you know, being subjected to, I, I find myself as a writer, as a literary writer drawn directly to the literary part of writing, which in my view condenses itself and in the short form and in poetry. And there's a lot of intermingling space between the two where, where the hybrid format is, 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 uh, is born. And I think th this is something which you can see not just in the Arab world, all over the world. The short story format is the place where new writing in prose is usually emerging and, and this is the area where I think poetry has came closer to, you know, I think uh, prose poetry has drawn itself towards the, 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 the narrative of the short story form. And, uh, and this is where you can see all of this uh, transforming. And this is where the area for experimentation and expanding the art of writing resides, yeah. Mm. Okay. And, uh... Just really quick before we move on to somebody else as well, I, you know, as you're also an editor with with the common, for instance, looking at short. So, what sort of attracts you to to a short story? How can you say, yeah, this is a short story that is interesting? Uh, yeah, as you said, I, I, a, a lot of a lot of the work should impress me artistically. This is. I don't look at a special format because, as I said, each short story has its or calls to its particular form. So you might say, sometimes you might see a, a classical short story, which I selected, but somehow it touches you artistically that it mobilizes new techniques or different techniques or new tools. Uh, for example, one of the, in, in the most recent portfolio I've, I've curated for the common, which is uh, for Palestinian writers, I will draw an attention to uh, one of the stories by a, a, um, an older short story writer, Mahmoud Shqir from Palestine. Uh, but his short story 
narrates itself without inter without any so the, the characters who are talking or speaking they transform as the text moves without any uh, you know uh, characterization of that we have a stop now and there's someone else is talking and he executes it in, a, in, a, in an excellent flow that it struck me immediately as this is a very interesting short story and it's executed in this very, very, uh, you know, new, fresh and creative way. And I'm inviting also whoever is listening to, to read that story, which is entitled A Letter to Kofi Annan uh, in the most recent uh, issue of The Common. Yeah, and the whole and the whole issue as well. Mm. Um, so, um, so to shift it to Maya, so you can un unmute yourself sort of in preparation. Um, I, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about how you came to translating this collection. And just in general, for you as a translator, um, how your projects have come to you and you know, to what extent are you looking out for something and to what extent are you waiting to be receptive to something? And how do you decide, yes, this is something I'm going to translate I want to, I'm committing to it, or I'll pass on this, this isn't for me. Um, all right, so how this project came to me first, um, frankly, um, Hisham had hunted me and uh, he had hunted me on, I believe, your recommendation, Marsha. Oh, he, oh uh, maybe. <laughs> is that, is, am I correct, Hisham, that you uh, asked Marsha? Yeah, I did ask Marsha, but I was also very impressed with your translation of, uh, let me just get the, the name correctly, the Libyan short story writer. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, um, the one about the lobsters. Lobsters. The lobsters who, who yeah. Ahmed, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ahmed Kattir, yes, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the, the bigger question of how things come to me or how I go to them um, it depends. There isn't a single or systematic way. A lot, you know, as you know, Marta, a lot of, I can't work full time as a literary translator because I need to feed myself. And so I am approached more than I am approaching people. Um, and what what makes me decide to go for something also depends. I mean, um, all right, let's go to the beginning. When I started translating Elias Khoury, it was purely out of love of his writing. I, it was my first work. I'd never translated a book. Um, we had no publisher. This was long before the internet. And um, I just did it because I was determined to bring it into English because I fell in love with his writing. Um, other books I was approached um, <clears throat> and I read the books and I liked them and I said, yes, I want to do this. Um, there's one book which I read um, and it was very challenging. I didn't love the book, but it was... Um, it was a good book for me to work on for a number of reasons, some technical, some practical. Um, and then, well, the monotonous chaos of existence was, uh, you know, I immediately liked uh, the stories and liked the poetry. I'm very sensitive to um, the sound of writing. So I, I write or I translate with my ears. And so, and I read with my ears. I don't really read with my eyes. And so if something sounds really wonderful to me, it makes me want to translate it. And so it varies. And sometimes I've been approached and I've declined because I didn't have time or I had another project. So it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit random. If I had my druthers, I would do this full time for a living and I would take on more work, but I can't. Mm. So there's some demand in the comments for the lobsters short story. It appeared in Bonnie Paul, correct? Is it online yes, anywhere yeah. that people can read it or? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I can look it up while 
somebody else. Is okay, all right. I, I just looked it up and I didn't see it, um, but I do it, think it was in the Libya issue of Money Pause. Yes, and that was about, I think, almost ten years ago. Mm. A long time ago. So do it's, you? Uh, so in that short story, actually, um, you're the the way in which you, you translated it, as I remember, was quite innovative. So do you feel, is there a difference in translating short stories? Are you tr um, drawn to sort of more experimental works or is that? That's a good question, actually. Um, that short story was extraordinary because it was written by Ahmed Papi in one long sentence. There isn't a single period or comma in that short story. And it's so well structured that there is no ambiguity. And I tried to pull off that challenge of doing it entirely without any punctuation, or at least without periods. There, there, was, there were uh, um, commas, but I couldn't. At, at the end, I had to break with a period and then finish. But it was a wonderful ex experience. It was really, a transcendent experience to do that. It it was, um, it was it was challenging, but in a in the best way possible. Mm. Um, I don't think you know when when Hisham approached me, I didn't really think about the form. I don't really think about those things. I think about how I feel, and if something is very evocative for me, and you know, makes makes me have a lot of feelings, um, then I want to translate it. And I don't really pay any attention to whether it's long or short or, you know, it just has to speak to me. Mm. Thank you so much, Maya. So I'm going to uh, turn to Michael now. And uh, so I often hear from translators, in fact, I did yesterday from, from Alex Ellenson actually, that they want to reach out beyond these sort of general niche trans, uh, general niche publishers like American University and Cairo Press, um, Interlink, et cetera, not to devalue them, but to other publishers that don't normally work with uh, Arabic literature and translation or even literature and translation. And I wondered how it, how you came together with this collection and how um, other translators can find you and whether you're, you're open to, to that sort of, uh, of thing rather than you know, sort of pigeonholing literature and translation in one place. Sure. So Hisham came to us uh, similar to how he came to uh, Maya in that we, we're open for submissions. <laughs> and I, I happen to be the one to find the manuscript in the slush. I happen to be the one who opened it up first and kind of took a look at it. And we've always been interested in literature and translation. You know, we always wanted to try, we wanted to uh, reach out to it. We like to challenge ourselves and we also like to challenge our readers. You know, one of Mason Jar's core values is putting work out there that particularly, you know, American audiences might not be as familiar with. And that includes literature in translation uh, and Arab literature and experimental challenging subversive works, which we think the monotonous chaos is all of those things. So it was something new for us that we were really excited to delve into. And working with the, the novel, or excuse me, the book of short stories, and then working through edits and finding, you know, having to go through the translator to kind of make it that extra step was a fun process for us and really kind of exciting to put this into our own resume, as it were, and to be able to put this work out into the world. Mm. So it's, there's, a, I, I can see from the, from the comments of, of people who are here right now at the event that a lot of them are professional translators. And so do you, I mean, 
if they have a, a new work, because usually it, I think it's more often the translator who's, I mean, Hishem is sort of unusual in that he can be the advocate for his own work in mm -hmm. English. But um, so do you think it's worth for trans translators doing to sort of broaden their scope and, and look around for, for different publishers who might not have been involved in literature and translation in the past? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had conversations with other independent presses uh, that we're friendly with about this work in particular. And, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of people are a little skittish about working with just the translator, just because, especially if it's uh, overseas or something along those lines, because, you know, you just don't want absolutely 100% know the relationship. So that's what, one thing that we request is that, because we do, we're totally open for translations at any point. We just request, you know, express written permission from, from the author. Like we want, we want the things to be just as on the up and up as possible. But yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, there's several independent presses that are always open for submissions and are, are similarly looking for these kinds of work. And we need it to come to us because we don't have the bandwidth to to, to kind of find it as it, as it were. Um, but we're always excited to see work that fits our mission and our aesthetic that we wouldn't otherwise have seen, which is why I was so, so excited when I read the book and I, I, I knew very quickly that I wanted to publish it. Mm. And is there anything different about how you want to be approached about a translation other than you want to make sure that the author is also involved in the conversation versus how somebody would approach you with a collection of English language short stories. No, I, I think having the author be as, as involved as possible and as, as interest dictates is really the only difference. You know, uh, the process would be, you know, roughly the, roughly the same just with that extra element. So, I, I don't think anything would really need to change on our end. Mm, okay. So uh, Pete, welcome uh, to this discussion uh, today. And I, I just wanted to sort of ask you as a political scientist who's written about Jordan, both about sort of the political landscape and, and the economic landscape, uh, I wanted to ask a question about, um, you know, how you read the literature coming out of Jordan now and, and the publishing industry and how you, know, how you see it as part of the political and economic landscape there. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. This is, uh, <clears throat> for someone that studies politics, uh, this is incredibly important because um, art and novelists or artists in general are incredibly important political actors, I think that are often overlooked, taken for granted. Um, but, you know, the, the, the position of the author or the artist in general in, in the Middle East is really historically layered and, and complex. And, and I'm not really qualified to talk about, you know, that position. But instead, I want to talk a little bit just specifically about uh, the role of the artist in general uh, in terms of political power um, in, 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 in the world we live in now and, and particularly in the Middle East. So. I think normally when we think of political power, uh, especially today, we usually think of guns, uh, we think of violence, uh, we think of ways to compel and force people uh, to do things, to destroy things, right? Um, and unfortunately, we see a lot of that uh, around the world. But one thing that that form of power or that, that use of tools can't do is it can't create anything, right? It can't build communities. It can't build social or political power. Uh, it's good at destroying. Um, and this is, I think, where artists uh, in general and novelists occupy very important positions of power, uh, not just in the Middle East, but, but all over the world, because uh, the power of an artist, even if it's very individualistic at first glance, is the power to create. You know, it's a power uh, to mobilize uh, the artist not just speaks in a language of the people around him or her, but speaks with symbols, 
and speaks with ways of encouraging um, that are particular and local, but they're extremely powerful because they can bind large groups of people uh, together who previously didn't think they had a connection. And so I think where we really did see this uh, in, in the Middle East was in uh, before, during, and after the 2011 uprisings. You know, these things, these events that occurred that spread across the region very rapidly, um, brought down long running autocrats in the region. Um, that in these times, we saw artists of a variety of stripes, from novelists to musicians, uh, not just be the troubadours of the revolution, but were actually leaders. They took leadership positions. They were trusted in ways that other authority figures were not. Um, of course, we know that those uprisings did not go the way of the organizers and the people that sacrificed. And some of those artists and some of those novelists today are in prison uh, that have had their liberty taken away. And I think that needs to be, uh, you know, the defeat was there, that, 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 that can't be ignored. But I guess, and I like the way Michael said that Hisham's work was subversive, um, because I think it is. I mean, I, when I read it, I read it as someone that's interested in politics. Um, and, and I think it, it's important to understand that artists and writers, uh, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world, they're very dangerous in terms of the people that are the political and economic elites. Uh, they wield forms of power that are not easily uh, ignored or easily repressed. Even if you could put someone in jail, you can't put their words in jail. You can't put their art in jail. Um, and so for me, uh, that's always the hopeful uh, part of politics that I take away, the, the, the ability for change and for that change to come um, from within and from people who normally you overlook, that you don't think that they're very powerful, but in fact, uh, they, they very much are. So Hashem, I'd be interested in having you just kind of respond to that. And then also, I mean, so to me, you know, there was this sort of 60s and 70s sort of literature of commitment and this 90s generation of intensely personal literature. And now there seems to be kind of a blend of the personal and political together. And I just wondered how you see the relationship of your, your work to, to power. Yeah, and it definitely cannot um, uh, yeah, and it box my writing as, a, as a, uh, a literature of commitments, because it's, uh, I would say, um, beat more or less pinned what I wanted to say regarding subversion. I always use this word subversive, but I always attach to it another word, which is active. Active subversion is, a, is an intentional work of the artist, not just to challenge the status quo, but rather to invoke questions. And as I would put it, you know, invent the reader to become a co-creator. So this, transformative process of inviting the reader into co-creation is actually not just subversion, but it's actually an invitation to construction or constructing the creative and constructing the alternative, at least questioning and starting from these questions to formulate uh, new ideas and uh, understand uh, the status quo in, uh, you know, from a new angle. I think our world is a really troubled world. I cannot overlook that fact and be selfish enough to, you know, become a complete introvert and just discuss myself and my own, you know, uh, my own feelings. Uh, I also think the writer, even the introvert writer is a direct product of the community of politics, of his family, of society, of relations, of the economy, of the, the, the environment. So I think it's not, you know, it's not the duty, but it's part of uh, your, the, an artist's normal existence is to acknowledge these influences and try to rework the objects of the world and become involved in uh, you know the world situation, especially if it's in a in the catastrophic situation that we find find ourselves uh, now, 
um, al adab al multazim or uh, the, the literature of commitment is quite didactic i um, the 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 late the, the later wave which you've mentioned i think it's quite selfish somehow or self absorbed and it came at a time when uh, there the, the the writer or the artist wanted to withdraw and i think this is another ideological position you know, you know to 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 you know uh, not look at oppression in the eye and deal with censor with censorship with oppression with the with the you know burning questions of the time uh, is is an answer as well it's an answer that is withdraw it's an answer that you know underlies withdrawal fear and uh, the, the inability, the inability to confront. And uh, I think now with the Arab uprisings, people have, you know, firsthand experienced uh, their transmor transformative power to a limit, of course. But they've experienced it. And I think, at least in my generation, this is this is the first time somehow that some something in this scope uh, happened. And this deeply affected. Uh, the way we write uh, and deeply influenced the way we write, not in the direct sense where we're writing about you know these events, but in the in the sense that we are using the tools and the experience that we've learned uh, to produce this kind of writing and this kind of literature, which, which extends in my own writing. It extends over all the books in different formats and different forms with different subjects, but. The, this thread is, is continuous and it's growing. Mm. So, Maya, there's some sort of uh, extension of this discussion in the comments. In uh, you know, how does the what role does the the translator play in this? How do you see the the literary translator's role in sort of the, the relationship between the political land, the political, the the power of of writing and um, and you know it's your sort of mediating role or recreating role well i think first of all the translator is this one other reader who is a co-creator as well this has been said much and it's becoming more of a cliche but i think uh, it is true because the the translator is writing the text in a different language and i was lucky enough to have you know, a translator like Maya, who is very sensitive to flow, which is very important to my writing. As she said, she reads with her ears. I write with flow. And this is extremely important in my writing. And it's uh, done in the Arabic language, which is completely different, as you both know, uh, since you both know Arabic, especially with how the you know the final letter of a word would merge with the tashkil into the other word and becomes this you know flowy river rather than you know a set of stops tut, 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 yeah so the arabic language enables me to do that and maya was excellent or great in transforming that so this is this is one thing and the other thing is maya is also involved she's the uh, she's a, an editor at the palestine studies journal or at the journal of palestine studies so so she she can yeah, and he deeply understand the nuances and the notions and the twists and the feelings that are embedded uh, within within the text and and recreates that uh, in the other language in in English. And then we can, through my knowledge of English, which is not as you know as uh, as good as hers, but at least we can we can find a medium to discuss what's happening and how it can also. Uh, improve and not just improve the translation. I also improved my own text through discussions with with Maya on the translation, uh, where I felt these these here these things here needs sharpening, rewriting. Concepts are not clear, and so on. So Maya, can if you could respond as well? Well, thank you, Hisham, um, for the for the very wonderful praise. I, I have to say that I too need to be, um, I too need to feel a political resonance from the text. I'm somebody 
who, you know, at my age, I've figured out who I am politically. And uh, if anything, I've become more quote unquote radical um, and more anti-status quo than I was, you know, when I was a young woman. And so for me, that's really important. That, that vein, it, it works a vein in me. It's also my way. It's also an outlet for me to express myself politically. You know, I don't, I don't do political work, overtly political work, but for me, translation is political work. Um, and what I love about working with Hisham is because he has enough English where I get into the kind of little, you know, it, translation is very, it's a very sort of fine grain thing. There's so many layers, it's, you know, yeah, the cliche, the onion, all the layers of the onion, but it's true because ultimately you're not, trans, you're not transferring a word into another word. You're transferring a meaning or an evocation or a feeling or, and it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily translate. So you have to find the way to convey what was conveyed by the Arabic to me, obviously to me, because I'm me. I don't know what it conveys to other people, but whatever it conveyed to me in all its sonority, political, poetic, lyrical, um, you know, imaginative, I have to reproduce those sonorities in English. And so, you know, it's not a matter of words. It's a matter of figuring out all those different layers. Um, and it's wonderful to work with Hisham because he knows enough English that I can say to him, this one, this little phrase, did you mean this? Did you mean that? What were you thinking of? Sorry, I have to. <laughs> um, uh, so I can really get to the sort of bottom of it. And he also, and, and I'm working at the moment with another author who does the same, who, who says to me, this is what I meant. I'm sorry. Is that Rula? No, it's a friend whom I said, I'm not available between 6.45 oh, and No, I mean the, the author you're working with. Oh, the, the author, yes, Rula. <laughs> um, you know, and it's a completely different kind of, it's a completely different genre. It's a novel, it has a, you know, middle, it has a beginning and a middle and an end and it has characters and, but it has a lot of socio-cultural and political undertow. And, and, you know, we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately, like Hisham, she will say to me, you know, the final decision is yours because you're the one who masters the English and who can tell whether this conveys what I meant. <clears throat> I was interested that you said, you say right in this translator's note in the, in the opening that this is a collaboration and I haven't seen an, another note sim, similar to that, not, not in your works so or maybe not in anybody's. No, so they have, you want to sort of state that up front? I think that that was, I don't know. Um, I don't quite know why, but it, it certainly was my process with Elias Khoury's work. We mm. went back and forth and back and forth. We really, we really worked and polished and refined um, the text together. Not so much with Sinan. I mean, with Sinan, there were backs and forths and obviously there were, you know, questions that I had and what about this and what about that? Um, so it's not with everybody. And I feel very privileged when I have that opportunity to have a true collaboration where I feel that I'm an equal voice, if you like, um, and that I can have a real dialogue and that I'm not just being handed something to do, you know, over there in that corner that we're working, you know, we're weaving it together. And that for me is very, very um, satisfying. Mm. So there's, um, Hisham mentioned- Can I, can I, can I oh, add just one note? Of on, well, also this notice is important because as I said, in the process, things changed in the Arabic original. So 
we change things in the book. So we know, yani, this note is also intending to say to the reader that the changes you will see here that are different from the Arabic original uh, regarding the Tartib uh, al-Qusas, how the stories are, uh, you know, uh, put mm. one after the other. There are sentences that have removed and changed. So this is part of the process and we want also to inform the reader who can read both versions that these were actually collaborative decisions that we did during the translations and I somehow relate them to the Arabic original later on. Mm. I'd like to add something, you know, a translation and maybe this is very, um, this is not very original and it's very basic, but I, I think that a translation isn't what we call in French in copie conforme, not a copy of, you know, the book. It's something, or the, the work, it's something else. And English has its own uh, needs. The language has its own needs. And so that also, sometimes you have to change the order of the sentences because in Arabic, there's a flow and there's a syntax and there's a buildup which works with the way that we in Arabic think and read and have from our literature, from our, you know, um, literary education. And it doesn't work in the same way in English. And to make it, to put it just in the same order, not just the order of the stories, I'm talking the order in, like syntax, you can't, <laughs> You can't reproduce Arabic syntax in English, and you can't reproduce Arabic uh, English syntax in Arabic. So you have to have that um, sort of, you know, spaciousness. Um, and to me, the closer you cleave to the original, the less spaciousness you have. Mm. And for me, it's a creation of a space as well, isn't it, Hisham? Okay. I agree. I agree. I think to create to create the flow or the as you said the effect. I write in a way that I want to push, you know, senses and emotions onto the reader, and I think this cannot be done if you would go for a more literal translation. But you need to restructure the entire thing to serve the same purpose in another language. And also, again, the, the words themselves, everybody knows that they, they are, you know, they have a load on them from history, from, you know, from being used in different kinds of ways. They have a psychological effect. They have a feeling to them. So if the translator did not have the, uh, not just the knowledge, but also the flexibility to, to deploy this knowledge, uh, it will not work, I, I think. So just to say, Maya, you're getting a lot of uh, inspirational on the, especially on the capaciousness, I think, uh, in particular. So this is something, the next thing I, I would like. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of what? I'm get, I didn't quite applause get Applause and appreciation. Oh, 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 okay. Okay, thank you. Um, this is something I'd like everybody to respond to from their different vantages. Um, Hisham talked about um, this kind of co-creating with the reader and creating a space with the reader. And a lot of Arabic literature and translation, it's published, but it doesn't find an audience. Not just that it sells only this, you know, a small amount of copies sometimes, but, but also that it's promoted in this very sort of specific their anthropological, ethnographic, um, utilitarian kind of way, uh, either that it's, you know, taboo breaking, the first novel, the first Jordanian novelist to write about whatever, unicycles, or, or, um, or, or that it's, you know, this particular, Hisham's book will teach you about Jordan, it's, it exists for this purpose. So I wondered, you know, from each of your perspectives, Michael sort of, um, you know, what, what do you do around the book in order to create community around the book rather than, you know, having it an object of existence? And, and Pete as well, you know, sort of, um, you know, if you, if you teach with literature or, you know, how to create a community around it rather than make it a separate object in Maya and Hisham sort of, I guess, obviously, however you want to address the question, so. 
Michael, maybe you can start. Sure, that's a great question. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit tricky to kind of answer it a little bit as directly as I think you might like, just because as an independent press, we have less resources that to kind of bring to bear to promote it than a more traditional publisher. So a lot that isn't to say that we haven't gotten behind it. You know, we've leveraged a lot of our existing contacts to get Hisham's book and his words in front of as many people as possible. Uh, he was recently involved in a, a conference, you know, uh, through the organization Barrel House, uh, Conversations and Connections, where he was able to, to read his, his book to, I don't know, a few, maybe a few hundred people online and uh, trying to get his, you know, excerpts and interviews and just uh, reviewed, like even we sent copies of the book to, to you know, book reviewers on TikTok to try to, to get his, I mean, honestly, and this is a bit of an aside, that's where a lot of these, that's kind of where the future of reviews in our mind are really going, aside from like the big trades like Publishers Weekly and, and New York Times, like the, the kids are on YouTube and they're on TikTok and they are getting their information from people who are, who are doing solid reviews and are, are talking about it there. You know, so we're treating it like one of, one of our babies, which it is, you know. Uh, I, I love how we were, they were talking about, uh, how Maya and Hisham were talking about it being a collaboration, because that's how we view our, our work with our authors, is we, we view it as a collaboration, and we bring uh, as much possible into it. And so... We, we treated it like all of our other books and just trying to get it out there as much as possible. And we, we think we've been pretty successful, you know, in, again, with our, in our, with our smaller reach. And mm -hmm. uh, did that answer? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily even about size, you know, a really small publisher yeah. can have on the back. There was a, a study that I found kind of hilarious of, um, Arabic literature and French translation and the things that were written on the back ja jacket um, and, you know, sex and taboo breaking appeared on, you know, numerous, you know, most of the novels and how many, how many times can you really break the same taboo? I don't know, you know, but um, so, you know, um, you know, kind of creates a distance, like this is an object, this is a yeah. separate thing. Whereas I think what, you know, you're talking about is, creating a community around the book in the same way that you would create a community Absolutely. around the book. Absolutely, yeah. I, 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 think, I think that's a really, a, a really kind of good way to, to, to put that is we, we have tried to create the community around it um, with, with everything that we can. Right, so I was gonna chime in because my other hat is I'm a teacher, I try to be a good teacher. And, and I think you're exactly right. The, so in the classroom, so I, my home university is in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and so I teach courses on Middle East politics. And, and I think this works for a, a lot of faculty that teach about other parts of the world. There's a, there's a real tough, um, there's a dilemma, which is you want to teach about politics so as to show that these a, a locality, right? A context, a rootedness, a history, right? And that's very important. But the other, but the other tough thing is you also want to link these local things to larger trends, to, to not place Latin America or the Middle East or Africa as something far away uh, that students then come into a classroom and put under a microscope. And of course, the Middle East with the, the generations of, of uh, this current generation and the ones before it had been steeped in a lot of uh, public discourse, a variety of varying levels of quality. So it's, it's very difficult to try to match those two um, uh, goals. Um, and, I, and I do think literature helps a lot. And, and there has been more and more uh, work coming out of the region. Some of it, you know, I agree, there's a taboo breaking. And of course, students 
uh, are hardwired to anything that's transgressive, right? Or it's they want to break. They love that, right? So there has been that work, and but I do think in my own experiences, I've run into another that that I use that work, but then it does hit a brick wall because it's hard to break out of. This is a story about Cairo, you know, or this is a story about a farmer in Palestine. Um, and you and and you lose some of that linkages, and I think it's also incumbent on a, on a on a teacher to be better at that. And this is something I'm trying to get better at. But one thing, and I've I've talked to Hisham about this. One thing I think that in the classroom that would help is if we could get more artists to be in residence at universities at at uh, art institutions. So in my in my in my city, Cleveland, we have we're very lucky. We have a lot of great museums. We have a lot of great artistic institutions. And it would be wonderful if we could think of ways to have campuses and these art institutions collaborate to bring artists, not just from the Middle East, but from other parts of the world, to be in residence and to engage students and to engage the community with their art. In a sense, it, it would bias having authors like Hisham who could speak to communities and in, in the language that's true. But I think this would be the next step because you can only expand the classroom so much as the faculty member who the students see 14, you know, weeks out of the year. Um, but yes, I, I think literature in the classroom is extremely powerful, um, but it's challenging. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if either Maya or Hashem wants to respond to that. Otherwise, we have a request. I would like to say something yes. about that. I, I understand your question to mean, how can we present literature without it being a sort of objectification of those other people over there? And of course, that is a, that is a you know, the $65 million question, because if you were to reverse the, you know, if you were to go to, I don't know, somewhere, far away, um, where people don't have very much knowledge, let's say, of the United States, and you were teaching American studies, one of the things that you would do is that you would use some novels or some works of art to introduce the students to um, another way of apprehending um, the United States besides, you know, history and politics and economics and whatever. But the problem is that we are in a colonial, anti-colonial relationship. And so that has to be taken into consideration. It's not neutral when our books about our uh, part of the world, quote unquote, are used to um, help students or, or make more available and accessible uh, knowledge about, about that part of the world. It's, it's a conundrum. And one of the things that I would suggest, Pete was saying, you know, we could have more artists in residence. And of course that would favor people who speak the, the language, um, but you could have also more translators, you know, because there are artists, of course you, as a translator, you can't speak for an artist, but if you've got enough, you know, if you've got a broad enough, I imagine if you've got a, a broad enough um, body of work, you might be able to help inter in that interaction with students to convey something about the part of the world that, for example, in my case, is the Arabophone world, world, not the Spanish world or you know, the Spanish speaking world. Can I comment briefly on that as well? Yes, and then we just, I, I promised this one uh, questioner that we would get to her before we finish, so yes. Sure, 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 just briefly. Well, also the kind of work I think dictates this approach. So I don't think my book can be used voyeuristically. I mean, to, you know, to have this, you know, but I think it can, what would it will do, the way it is written is it will invoke questions and invoke a deeper gaze into let's say our global you know our global global problems and global catastrophes that are prevalent coming from this side of the world into 
the entirety of the world. This is this is one 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 uh, notion. The other thing I want to commend Mason Jar Press. The book behind you does not have a, this the usual cover of a translated book. The blurbs that were used and uh, presented on the book, the way the book is being presented, it's not being presented as this you know exotic item of literature from the from the Arab world, but it's it's being presented as a work of literary art. And I think this also makes uh, uh, you know, a huge difference in, on how the publisher deals with the work and whether they respect the work as a work of literature or they use it as a, a commodity or an item that will uh, just bring them profit. And this is why I think indie presses and Mason Jar Press uh, are, are, are very important in this discussion. So, um, so this uh, Anne McCall has has requested that we read a short passage and that you discuss some of the the translation um, things that arose during during that passage. So, M Maya, I know that you don't have the. I know that you're traveling and you don't have your book on hand. But if you if there was something you wanted to point to. Um, it, in particular, or Hishem, if there's something you want to point to where you felt, where there was some back and forth about the translation. Well, I think the largest back and forth was on orchestra <laughs> because Maya worked on, on many, many, many different, uh, you know, drafts of that work because it is very difficult to reproduce the Arabic flow on that text. So maybe you choose whatever, whatever excerpt you want to read from that, and then Maya can comment if, you, if she wants. Okay, Maya, do you have? Is there a movement that you would prefer that I read from? First, second, or third? No. Okay, I'll just start at the beginning then. First orchestra, first movement. She was seated at the black piano. The music had evaporated from her head and only crooked melodies stumbled from her fingers. When she turned around, his eyes were looking straight into hers and the kiss he blew into the air teased her lips. When she placed her slender fingers inside his mouth, the crookedness of the melodies receded. And when their two bodies joined, the place reverberated with music. So that's just a tiny, um, a tiny amount of, of the translation. So sort of what, what kind of choices would you say were, were involved in that? You gotta unmute yourself though, Maya. Um, I remember asking uh, Hisham about the girl who was playing the piano. And I had to, I had to rework that first sentence a lot because depending on if you read the sentence again um i can tell you what the choices were and you know okay. what, what yeah she was seated at the black piano right that's it full stop yes and and so i remember that we talked about that we re, um we talked about um and then wait, there's another sentence. I don't, but in the Arabic, I don't remember if it was one continuous sentence or not. What's the next sentence after that? The music have, had evaporated from her head and only crooked melodies stumbled from her fingers. Okay. Um, I think Maya was, is referring to the third movement. Okay. Which is, yeah. the, which is the, the most complex of all these. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was so long ago. I, yeah, I know, I know. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't remember all the book, I can. That's why. It's nice <laughs> to have yeah. the questions. Yeah. The so song, just, to con can... just to contextualize things for the audience, for the, whoever is listening. Yeah. So these three movements, this is the maybe the only story that deals with love in the entire collection. And it's the last. No. Uh, this is what the one with the cigarette. The one with the cigarette. No, no, this is no, no. This is not the one with the cigarette. This is the one where both of them are sitting and reading poetry, and then there's this convergence of events where you no longer 
understand if this is them or the poetry that they're reading. Maybe, Marsha, if you can read the third movement. Yes. And then, yeah. Afterwards, she'd sat in his lap while they read what they could in the way of poetic verses, wrapping their bodies around the music of the words. The ballerina who had tumbled from her lips only moments earlier leapt into the air and snaked across the winding river of fire on the floor. Naked, she circled the perimeter of the body swollen with desire, ascending toward her rider who sat godlike and aloof upon the sofa, or so she thought, where he counted each breath and gathered falling stars, fortune tellers signs, and what to the listening ear are ciphers of inspiration, packing them all into the jumble of his brain to conjure them up with ink on the desert of parched white paper. But her writer, the one who is contaminated by minds outside his own and chafes against bodies made of flesh, igniting the brazier's spark that lights the coal stack, propelling the driving wheels which overturn the rusty engine of time. That writer of hers was not the one, the unparalleled, the everlasting. He was hewing his way through a forest of desire, erupting from pomegranate breasts, gulping down the liquor of saliva and biting on the stretch of alabaster that led to the promontory of bliss and down, down to the delta of pleasure. That writer of hers generated fire, piercing the mother's grass with the father's flint until their creamy froth mixed. The ballerina was furious. She raged and she screamed, then realized that her feet rested on the cadence of the two bodies, that her dance was born of their climax, that the melody she held aloft rose and fell to the rhythm of the gasps cascading from her lips and his. The ballerina understood that her resurgence dwelled in the fevered delirium of the two joined bodies. That was the third movement. <laughs> hard. That was hard to, mm -hmm. to make that flow in English. But I don't have anything very um, original or intelligent to say. <laughs> I just work really hard with, with Hisham. <laughs> so that we could, you know, use the same images, you know, the engine and the rusty wheels and the, um, the, the you know, the, the mother's uh, grass and the father's flint. I mean, those were references in Arabic literature, you know, that are evocative anyway, or evoke for Arabic readers. Um, they're, you know, they're indirect, but they immediately evoke certain images. And it was, it was a challenge to make it happen in English, where I think that we speak in less roundabout ways, um, generally, about um, eroticism and sexuality. Hisham, I want to hear what you have to say. Because yeah, I feel... yeah, well, this was, well, I, I wrote, the book is, basically written in 2010 and this was basically me flexing my literary <laughs> my literary muscles this is a prose text written uh, written as sha'r mm -hmm. so it's 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 poetry that uh, rhymes but does not align with the rhythm right or it's the other way around ah it has rhythm but oh. the, no rhyme oh. so there's yes. So, yes. so there's no meter there is a meter sorry but there's no Rhyme no the rhyme. And the entire piece is written that way. So it is a metered piece with no rhyme. And all this is, I think, very finely, as you read it, Marsha, I can't read it with, with the flow you've read it with. But yeah, obviously, really, yeah. anyone who, who, who listened to you will get that flow. I was getting that flow uh, from, from the piece. And this is actually um, very very hard to do in another language especially with that arabic enables me to do that because of the tashkil what is the word in english for tashkil uh, Naya? You say tashkil <laughs> yeah yeah no. you don't really the tashkil is the the use of diacritical marks to um to convey um uh the place of the word syntactically but I don't know what you call it in English. No, is it is not just that. It is uh, this is for for, for uh, whoever does not is not accustomed to the. So each English each English word 
is ends with a stop. So when I say this, I'm stopping oh, all the time. So it's what we call in French. Yeah. What in we call Arab in French. Language, like you we have a movement at the end of the word that mixes that word with the following word. So yeah. It's so it's very, you know, moldy, and you can work with that really nicely. It's, it's yeah. like what is called in French la liaison. So if you have a T at the end of a French word and an E at the end of the at the beginning of the next one, you link the T and the E. You don't stop at the T and then yeah, start at yeah, the E. Yeah, but in Arabic and, that happens in all the words. Almost, yes, almost exactly. all the words. Almost, not, yeah, not all, not but all, a lot. All. Yes. Uh, and so think, it's a it's, it's a work of that's why it's a work of melody. Yeah. Um, more, more than it is a work of meaning. In yes. my mm. yes, correctly, correctly. It's a, it's a, it's an experiment on the boundaries of musical melody of uh, sorry of the word the sentence and the word the language is melody. This is yeah. what exactly this piece is is all about. But despite the fact, you know, the almighty leader will will have a guest appearance also also in the second movement. So we also involve different themes that even in this linguistic experiment of aesthetics, we have the almighty leader sitting there on the wall looking at us. <laughs> yes, and, it, and it's, there's very clearly a political content yeah. when you get to the second movement, you know, it's all there because there are his thugs are listening and, you know. Yeah, this in particular, this part reminded me of what Michael Cooperson did in Impostures. I don't know if you've seen that mm -hmm. translation, but, um, you know, he used these kind of, um, you know, different flexes of the Arabic to try and recreate flexes in, in English. Um, so we've sort of reached the end of our hour. I just want to say that um, um, Curtis Ryan wants to give a shout out to Hishem and a bonjour to Pete. Um, and McCall is appreciating that you're trying to show a bit of the process. And Nariman says she could definitely hear the rhythm and well done, Maya. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for, for being here today. I really oh, appreciated this sort of wide ranging discussion around the book. Um, yes, it was so nice to be with you all and to meet you, Pete, and to meet you, Michael, and to put faces. Um, I hope we have another chance to meet again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.